Staying across the road. Yeah, that's fine. I'll come mind to see that. Um, no, all right. Well, they're going to kick us out. No, I don't think they'll get out. They seem they pretty know. friendly enough. Well, we can't get one. Just to show. We won. Okay. Why do you want to go all over? Okay. She's very nice. She might go. Out of the camera shot. Yeah. 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 No, I don't give that you. Okay. What's that? I'm just too sorry, I'm asking. We're only going to be here. Oh, yeah, like we're just going to go and leave you as you go. Yeah, we're not going to kick up that after. So, still seven, eight? Yeah. We'll be fine. Ladies and gentlemen, we've stood up from the word go and told you that the way video games operate is that they change the perception people have of how society operates and that they incentivize people to take violent action. We've said all along that that's a matter of degree and that for somebody in a well-off middle class family that might result in, say, a lesser ability to use conflict resolution, whereas for somebody in a very poor family who already has a propensity to violence, it will push them far further. The reason I re-emphasise that key element is that it undercuts the essence of our case, that we don't have to prove that there are going to be 10 million murders occurring because of what happens in video games. Instead, all we have to do is show that video games are a threat to society because of the way they incentivize individuals to take more violent actions than they would otherwise, and also because of the contingent harms in terms of isolation of individuals. There are two points then flowing from that. The first is about violence in society, and the second is about the other harms from individual isolation. The key about the reason video games promote violence is something which the negative team have missed all along. Because regardless of points about fantasy, and regardless of points about strategy, our sole point which came out from Paul remains. Video games necessarily reward people when they kill people. When I go out and harm somebody, I gain points in that game or I achieve the strategic objectives which the negative team wanted to talk about. The point is that all the time, the way to achieve strategic objectives, the way to win points in the game, the way to get stars floating around your opponent's head in a game of Wii, is to actually cause direct violence to them. Why is that crucial to our case? The reason it's crucial is for two reasons. The first, is that people don't operate in a rational sense where they say, here's the world of gaming and here's the real world. Actually, people develop through their experiences. And Paul gave you very good analysis about why the experiences of games mean that when a person is, is, inflicts harm on another person, they feel good about that. Now that is completely irrelevant in that whether that occurs in a book, in a movie, or in a fictional game, or in the real world. The point is that there's a direct correlation between step one, harm to another person, and step two, benefit and feeling good to yourself. What that does is it means that individuals make the connection in their brain between harming one person and benefiting themselves, and that flows into broader society, regardless of whether or not that occurs in a fantastical realm. The key underneath all that is the way people's connections operate, not in a rational, here's the fake word and here's the real world sense, but in an experiential learning sense, as we've said from day one. The second key point about that, which they haven't addressed, is the nature of the people who are playing video games. We've said down the line that it's particularly young people, and young people don't come out and have experiences where they make rigid distinctions between reality and between fantastical worlds. Indeed, young people often create fantastical worlds which shape their learning. Take the example of young people who play with fictional dolls quite often. That is creating a social interaction about how they view girls, for example. Girls who play with Barbie dolls see girls as being skinny and see girls as having long necks and beautiful long blonde hair. That's clearly a fictional reality. That's a fantastical world. But individuals shape their experiential learning through that and that's why they haven't engaged with the peculiar role of youth in this. But second to that point about youth is that actually the particular youth we're talking about are those in families who are less likely to be looked after and less likely to have other social, re social relationships. Harmon's response to this was to say, oh no, actually, what happens in society is that 
Just because your parents don't care about you, it doesn't mean you're a bad individual and you have a higher propensity to violence. Actually, yes it does, because if you're not engaging with your family, then you are engaging with games as your mechanism for experiential learning, and therefore you're increased towards violence. So two key reasons. One, experiential learning incentivizes violence, and two, the peculiar nature of youth forces them not to be able to make this rational distinction. That's why none of their analysis about fantastical points and about strategy applies, because they haven't addressed with the crucial nature of games. But then secondly, even if we can, even if we look to that point about fantastical reality and this and the strategy of the team, then what we say is that actually they've conceded that people can escape to these games. Their whole second point, which Alec and Hannah brought up, about how it's beneficial for individuals to go to these games because it provides an outlet from the real world, shows that individuals are using these games for escapism. If Alec's point that individuals can leave from the fears of society and take it all out on video games stands, then he's accepting that people are becoming immersed in video games and treating those games as reality. So their own analysis undercuts yeah, that's why they're going, oh no, because the second point completely undercut their first point. If people flee to games, to find an outlet for their frustrations with society, they're necessarily not calling that reality fantastical. They actually are making it a reality, and it's coming to it. So, firstly, it falls because their points are relevant. Secondly, it falls because they've conceded it and their own analysis is contradictory. Let's look to the second issue then. What are the other issues which this creates for society? What Will told you very clearly at second was that in order for, a, for people to be able to actually participate in video games, they necessarily withdraw from society. That when somebody plays in a video game, they sp spend less time interacting with other people, and that this is a detrimental thing. Well, the reason it's detrimental thing is that they're interacting with people in a violent setting, and not interacting in the real world with people in common ways. The only response from the negative team on this was that, oh, well, no, because they have a social community around them, that they feel happy because they're hanging out with other people who are killing people. As we've said down the line, that's not the type of violence and the type of interaction we want to incentivize. But the second point on other benefits to society involves harness substantive which was about how this is somehow beneficial because it provides a hobby and provides an outlet for individuals to embrace. We say that that analysis is fundamentally flawed. There are two types of stakeholders we could be talking about. The first stakeholder are individuals who are very sociable and who are not actually tending towards violence. We say that in that case, they're fine and they're not having any difficulty with socialising at present. Instead, if they start participating in video games, all that does is remove them from society. That's only seven, right? Yeah, I yeah. know. All that does is remove them from society. The second type of stakeholders are people who are actually really anti-social already. And what the negative team wants to tell you is that they get a hobby and they take out their frustrations with the world by playing these video games. The problem with all that analysis is that it tells these frustrated, violent individuals that it's a good thing to take out your frustration with society by killing people. Even if you empower people, or even if you make those people feel good, the problem is that you increase the antisocial and you increase the violent tendencies. The only benefit they could claim is that it might reduce their ability to commit crimes in the short term because they're committing crimes in video games instead. But in the long term, they'll want to commit violent games because you're incentivizing more violence. Two reasons. One, video games promote violence. And two, the other benefits are not significant and are offset by the isolation and the increase in violence which video games produce. We're proud to propose.